everyone, I'm Steve, Mark's working late tonight, and this is Smokey Steve and Mark. Either welcome or welcome back, and happy Thursday. I hope all of you are well, safe, there's so many things anymore to be well and safe from or for. Uh, whichever ones are impacting you, I hope you are doing okay, or I hope things are improving at least. Um, we're dealing with a little snow here, it is nothing compared to what some other folks are dealing with. Plus, we're used to it here, so it's no big deal. However, story before the story, because today is Thursday story time, uh, I did go out around my lunch break to go get uh, smokes and a soda. It's like the only routine I've kept from my original like office job schedule is at noon, cigarettes, soda. I go to the little bodega around the corner, I'm walking back, and I slip. And I half fall, twist as I'm going, like down on one hand, half on the butt kind of thing. And didn't notice it at the time, but then I get home and I sit down and I go to stand up and it's unbelievably painful <laughs> to do so. Um, it, it's So I kind of hobbled around a little and came up with a game plan. So right now I am in bed. Uh, I just finished up working. So at the moment I have two laptops, my work and my own, two phones, personal, work. Um, I have this, I grab the tripod on a walk, I have the phone we film with, too. Uh, my ashtray overfloweth like Mount St. Helen, because I'm just camped out for everything. I'm camped out. Mark works late tonight. Um, so I've got to ambulate on my own here, so I try to make everything close by. So that also means that you're going to be in bed with Steve. So I'm trying to think of like a hot bedtime story, but I don't really have any, because I'm not hot like that. What I did think I would talk about, a couple questions came up when I uh, put it out there if anyone had any topics or ideas for story time. And there was a couple that had to do with mental health. So I thought I would bring you um, to my own current diagnosis. For anyone who hasn't been paying attention uh, or who's new to the channel, uh, I have a mental illness. I have a few that I've been diagnosed with. Um, I would consider myself to be in recovery um, because the condition of my life is quite a bit better now that I'm addressing them, than it was before when I was not. Uh, but my diagnoses are, I have bipolar disorder, bipolar 1, bipolar affective disorder, I know the DSM-5, the language changed. Um, leftovers of OSFED, eating disorder not otherwise specified, mostly preoccupations, not so much behaviors, and body dysmorphia, <laughs> co-occurring, and uh, substance dependence, alcohol in remission. So, substance use disorder and remission. You know, a little bit country, a little bit rock and roll. I could just couldn't decide what kind of crazy I wanted to be. So, how could anyone not notice this? Because all of this diagnosing and things didn't, like, it came back and forth. And if you have mental health concerns or have been in the mental health system, you probably have observed this in somebody else or maybe you've experienced it yourself where... Obviously, medications, if you've taken them, change over time. Diagnoses can change over time if new symptoms are presented, or if you just go see a different doctor. It, it, sometimes that depends. I can't tell you your story. I can tell you mine, though. So I didn't present in front of a professional for mental health treatment of any kind until I was about 17. Um, did I start having mental health issues before that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, crazy anxiety as a kid. I had an ulcer by the time I was 11. Hated teachers, hated screaming, hated school, didn't want to go, was legitimately sick and didn't want to go to school, but I was sick with anxiety for the most part. And I didn't know how to explain that, so I just said I don't feel good. And I didn't, but I didn't relate the two. So then we get into high school and I'm still skipping school and everything. Then I went from fat to thin around 16. And this is where head started to turn a little bit to teachers, friends, maybe something isn't right, because I lost like 100 pounds in about 10 months. Some healthfully, so everybody encouraged it, and good note, you know, if they knew what you were doing to get thin, they wouldn't encourage it, but they didn't, and I, you know, was getting a lot of compliments and didn't want to stop the unhealthy eating disordered behaviors that I was doing to get and stay thin. So that culminated, I wrote a paper for my senior essay or something, which nowadays would have been probably acceptable and applauded, but at that point sounded like a suicide note, I think. Um, and a teacher said, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't feel this is appropriate for an essay or whatever, and then gave it to the guidance counselor, who gave it to the principal, who called my mother, I think, and I ended up in front of a deacon who was a social worker 
through the diocese. I went to a Catholic school. I got to miss class once a week to go to therapy. So I went. Uh, I was given the Dr. Burns 10 Days to Self-Esteem, which therapists get real excited about giving. You think they wrote it themselves. They hand it to you like, this book is gonna... Anyone who says this single book is gonna change your life is not to be trusted. A plethora of books can change your life. One single one, no. Maybe a re you could make an argument for a religious text. Maybe. But outside of that, no. Read more than one thing. So, it didn't do much. And I then went to college and loosely kept in touch with that therapist. It wasn't a psychiatrist, it was just talk therapy. And then I had a really rough freshman year with substance use and abuse and all sorts of other issues, and that put me in front of a psychiatrist who diagnosed me with depression because I was crying and had self-injured, and they figured, depression. It must be depression. So I figured, well, that's, that's it. That's final. I have depression. I will just take antidepressants. And like some people, unfortunately too many people with mental health issues, Find something that works and stop doing it immediately. <laughs> so uh, the antidepressants would work, the depression would lift, I might skyrocket into mania, which I didn't recognize as such at the time, and then I'd be, I'd be gravy. So I'd go off and on them. All through college I went off and on, off and on, with the same diagnosis as far as I knew. Um, I had an ex in 2004, maybe, t no, 2003 or four, who did not like me being on medication, so I went off of it, because that's a great reason. And I immediately lo started losing weight, um, because medications have... They're not high-calorie foods, you know what I mean? Like, antipsychotics are not 1,000 calories a pill. That's But it can... It's harder to shift weight, it's harder to lose weight, and it physically made me more hungry. And unless you are, have an Iron Man you know, constitution and can resist urges a lot. I mean, it's it's hard not to eat on some of these medications, too. So I lose a bunch of weight, we break up, and then I'm skeletal within months and don't see a psychiatrist again until I get full-time insurance a year after that. I picked up a full-time job a year later. Then I got insurance. Then I'm being treated for depression. Then I'm being treated for insomnia. Then I'm treating myself with alcohol and going to the psychiatrist, taking the pills they give me, not telling them anything about how much I'm drinking, because, of course, they would tell me to stop. And I was convinced it was the only thing that was helping. It would help me sleep, it would calm my anxiety, it was a little bit of social lubricant. But by the time I was seeing the psychiatrist and that, there was nothing really social about my drinking. Nothing too social about guzzling Listerine in a Burger King bathroom. It's, it's not social. So... I take a leave from work there, we're talking like 2004, and I go to outpatient mental health treatment in something I didn't know at the time. It was called a partial hospitalization program. So it's a step down from an inpatient unit, but it's hours a day, maybe four or five, and it was like three, four, five days a week. And me, being mortified that I needed that kind of help, went to group, and I felt a little out of place. Some other folks there had been sick for a long time. And they'd been resistant to treatment, and some a lot of them were elderly uh, psychiatric patients who had had years of harsh medications and treatments, and their their bodies and their their pace and their speech showed all that. I, I felt out of place. They thought I was an intern. You know, the staff talked to me like I was a staff member, junior therapist, junior patient, because I was mortified at my circumstances. Um, my diagnosis didn't change. I go back to my old psychiatrist, and then crash, burn, move home. And then still depression. Now substance use is creeping onto my chart, but I mean, how could it not at this point? You know, after I lost the job, the car, the apartment, had to move back in with the parents. When you go from sleeping in a bed back to sleeping on a futon, you're not moving up in life. Like, that's, you're not going somewhere good, I think. Personal, Steve's opinion, you know. Um, so that was a step back. Then I started into drug and alcohol and mental health treatment. And it took from 2000, when I was in college, in the year 2001, spring, to the spring of 2009 to get diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Two at the time, because I hadn't had a full manic break. So the diagnosis had changed, because it was observed that I was having other 
reactions and other stuff like that. How do we get there? By not treating it or giving me medications that send me into mania. So it's kind of like trial, it was almost like trial by fire. If we give you this and you react poorly, then you have bipolar disorder. Oh, really? Well, let's find out. I understand, and I think many other people who use medication as part of their mental health treatment, because there's certainly many that don't, and that's their prerogative, and some of them I know have great recovery. So I'm, I'm saying this is what I do for mine. It's probably only about half of what I do for my recovery. Um, meds can make you... I don't know. Jury's out. I mean, I'm on more medication than I would prefer to be on, honestly. Uh, polypharmacy is a big deal with folks. They just add one more med and one more med for one more side effect for one more med, and that's the loop I kind of find myself in. And so every so often I try to work with my doctor to get off one of the meds I'm taking, only in the interest of taking less. But if my sanity gets compromised, you know, that doesn't really work <laughs> for me. Um, so I left, so backtracking, uh, the partial program I went to, that didn't work, did some outpatient drug and alcohol treatment, that didn't work, we get up to 2009, I'm diagnosed, then I start getting a little better. Now, I'm so sucked into the drinking that any sort of mental health treatment probably wasn't going to help at that point. Um, I was on a decent cocktail of meds, but I was, none of them say to take with alcohol, none of them. They all say don't, in fact. So to say I was taking them as directed would not be accurate. <laughs> and I would take them when I felt like them. If I wanted to drink instead of, um, I didn't want to get drowsy, I would skip the antipsychotic medication because it made me drowsy and I would just drink instead. Uh, if the medication, I was on lithium for a while and you're not supposed to drink with it, I'd be like, screw it, who cares? Um, I'd rather drink than deal with liver damage from the lithium. Like, I, you make up all sorts of stupid excuses when you're somewhere between an addict and not stable, or you're an unstable addict, and it, it snowballed onto itself. Um, couple more med changes, left, right, and center, and then in 2011 I was in the hospital back-to-back -back within two weeks. Med changes again. I was taken off an antipsychotic medication. Told by the doctor that I was just a depressed alcoholic and that we all, we being addicts, all get diagnosed bipolar. Okay. So he changes my meds back to just plain old depression meds like any old drunk. And I go home and then within two weeks I'm back in the hospital because we had the mad tea party, which I don't know if I've shared that story. I probably have otherwise. The gist of it is that the med change didn't go well. And, um... The day leading up to going back into the hospital was, was a little curious, I think. So, that, that could be for another time. That involves my mother, my aunt, my local Potunk hospital, um, me being quite unwell. Rachel Ray worked her way in there. It's, it's for another time. So, that's how they found out. I go, I go back and see the same doctor. He's like, what happened? I said, I took my meds as directed. You told me to take this. I told you what I was diagnosed with, and you told me to take this because you thought otherwise. Well, hell's bells. The patient had information about their own health care. Who freaking knew? At least I'm not bitter. But at any rate, finally was diagnosed and got treatment. 2012, my entanglements with the legal system got me into a court-ordered rehab that I could not leave. I never left rehab anyway. I was like star patient. I was ass kissing. That's how I was in rehab. This time I went in with the attitude that I have no idea what the hell I'm doing or what's going on in my life. And I have no idea how to fix it. I went in very, somewhere between defeated, humbled, uh, lost, apathetic. It was all in that vein, you know, uh, 12 step philosophy would call it almost willing. That's what they use to get people kicked off into recovery. They're like, if you're, if you're willing willing to do what they say, willing that will get your foot in the door. And 12 step stuff helps a lot of people too. It wasn't so much for me. I did a lot right when I got out of rehab for like a few years. And then I kind of, I don't want to say I outgrew it, but there were things that were part of, not the fellowship, but part of the program that I didn't feel connected with. And, and I didn't feel like sitting there feeling like a hypocrite. So I stopped going. I'm still in touch with some of the friends I had. Uh, some of them, when you're not part of their group, they don't talk to you anymore. And that was unfortunate. So, get the drug and alcohol under control. Then I'm left from then to now dealing with bipolar disorder, which has then flipped 
in the meantime to bipolar one because I've had a full manic break at that point, not induced by a medication or drug related issue. So it was my understanding at the time as it was written and it might be different in the DSM five, like I said, that if you have a manic episode, manic being full blown, like over the top for me, a manic episode, I have a lot of generic symptoms and they're actually, I'm fortunate, really well controlled by medication and I'm not that severe. But when they do happen or when they happen without meds, I would be extremely talkative, very, very talkative, talking in a thousand directions. Um, I might present as if you think I have like OCD. I don't. I don't have OCD about anything except occasionally weight, calories, and numbers left over from the eating disorder. Otherwise, I don't. Um, opinionated, talking over you. Mine's mostly verbal. That's my biggest cue. I may lose weight at the drop of the hat for without dieting. Just in a week, I could drop five pounds just because I can't sit still. Um, what else is going on? I might take on a new project or five. <laughs> and then and then abandon all of them in short order. Uh, I may call people in the middle of the night because uh, I'm feeling euphoric about it. It could also mean I'm irritable, though, and agitated. There's different turns on it. That's more of like a mixed episode. All the agitated feelings and, and the depressed feelings and all that stuff, but with energy. So it's irritable. It's agitated. That's the most uncomfortable. That's the kind of mood when I would get myself into the most trouble because I'd have all those apathetic, screw it, what's the consequences of it, and all this unstable, reckless energy with which to do something. So it was the years after I started getting better, like 2012, like eight, nine years ago, that managing the bipolar was pretty much just what it was. And my diagnosis didn't change, but the treatment sure did. Pills up, pills down, into therapy, out of therapy, into couples therapy with Mark, which we did for a little over a year, I think. And a fair amount of it had to do with me having bipolar disorder. There were other issues in the relationship, but part of the relationship where Mark and I had differed originally was we had to list our priorities. The therapist said, list your top three priorities for this. And Mark's was relationship and mine was sanity because... And as I explained, and as we got to, because it took a few sessions, um, if I'm not sane and stable, I can't be a good partner. I can't be a good employee. I can't be a good son, brother, uncle, anything. I can be in a relationship on paper, but I can't contribute anything. I can't do anything. All I can do is suck up attention. Because when I'm sick, can't, again, not speaking for all ment folks with mental health concerns, I become exceptionally self-centered when I'm, I'm feeling mentally not well. It's not deliberate, but it's annoying. <laughs> and let me, all, let me also lay this out there, too. There are certain things that are part and parcel of a person's, like, personality, and certain things that are symptoms, and certain things are just the way a person is. Here's an example when I talk about being hyperverbal and talking a lot. Now, if you and I are talking whoever you are, hi, and we're having a conversation and I'm symptomatic. So I'm talking a lot and I may start talking over you. Now that's rude, but I'm not doing it intentionally. I'm having symptoms. It's not malicious. I'm just talking because I'm having rapid fire speech and I can't help it. So even though it's rude to do, the intention isn't malicious to do it. However, if we were talking... I don't know, politics, mental health, something I was really, you know, about. I may also talk over you in a situation like that. Now, that's not because I have a mental illness. That's just me being rude, <laughs> period. That's just me being an asshole. That's me knowing how to converse with people and be respectful and choosing not to do it. That's a conscious choice. The hyperverbal stuff isn't. So I'm not talking about accountability. Whatever happens, whether I'm sick or not, I have to bear the responsibility for those actions. But my intent is was not to harm when I'm symptomatic, uh, even though the outcome could be the same, hurt feelings and stuff like that. Uh, dealing with um, having bipolar disorder for so many years or any other mental illness or anything like that, addiction, is cleaning up messes and rebuilding trust which is very, very hard, and have make, making sure people don't worry. Like, 
there's almost no amount of time of health, recovery, and healing you can go through that will satisfy some people who will still look for the littlest thing going on in your life. They're, How's your day going? Eh, it's okay. I've had better. Oh my god, do we need to take him to the emergency room? No. No, it's very human and very normal and very sane to have bad days. You know, health and wellness it's, is, is on a spectrum. And some of us get to the end of the spectrum a little easier than others. Um, my mental health sometimes becomes so unstable and so unmanageable that I need to be put in a safe place to be monitored, remedicated, where I can recoup and be released. Um, there's other things I do to help stay well. Also, other people choose to do different things. I have a, I have a couple friends who deal with delusional disorders, like schizophrenia, things like that, who manage with less medication than I do. And, but they do a lot more what's called personal medicine. So they do meditation. They exercise regularly. One is, uh, does an acrobatic diet and they do different things to help themselves. And you can't argue with results. They're happy, healthy, and productive. So, you know, I'd have to say their recovery is their own. It's not how I choose to run mine, but they have good recovery regardless. Um, and there's a lot of different ways recovery looks also. I've had a couple friends who went, who got out of rehab, for example, drug and alcohol, went to AA, um, didn't like it, stayed sober, but their family still cut them off after like an intervention because they stopped going to AA. So the intervention wasn't really about getting sober. It was about AA membership, um, which caused a rift that didn't need to happen, I don't think. But so... Today's another bipolar day. And what's weird is that some days, I'll tell you this right now, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm smiling. I took an extra Neurotin. I usually take two a day. I took the third because I thought maybe it would help. Um, and it kind of is. You make do with what you got. I still had to work. Still wanted to make a video. I can still do, by being bipolar and managing my mental health means I can, managing my mental health and recovery means I can still do the things I need to do in life, I just may have to do them differently. If that means work today was done from bed, and filming was done from bed, <laughs> then so be it. It's These are called reasonable accommodations when you work for yourself, i.e. work on YouTube. Sorry, I didn't even need a smoke break for myself. So, yeah, those are my sort of reasonable accommodations for, for working from home, for doing YouTube from home. So I hope you don't mind. I did break out coffee in a cat sweater. I got Bandit here. He's on the edge of the bed. He's been following me around. And um I'm just going to I'm just going to chill out here I think until Mark gets home. I can get to like the bathroom and shit. I do this. I do this all the time. When we shoveled snow, I hurt my back and it hurt that day and the next day it was gone. So I don't think anything's wrong. I just I'm annoyed for the most part because well, I mean, I got the dishes done and all the other stuff done. So I guess there's really no reason to get up. But I'd like to, you know. Oh, well. It's an excuse to catch up on gossip, drama gossip and stuff like that, I guess. So thank you all for watching. Thank you for joining. Thank you for listening. If you have any comments, please feel free to leave them down below. Um, I'm this week getting back into doing some comments. I caught up on yesterday's video, I think, and I'm starting to work on the day befores. Uh, so I will ask if you have any questions, please feel free to email them to us. Um, probably a better bet to email a question than to leave it in the comments, but either or is cool. And um, thanks again. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. You can follow Mark and I on Facebook at Smokey Steve Space and Mark or on Instagram at Smokey Steve and Mark or on Twitter. Our handle is at Smokey Steve A. Our email address and our contact information is listed all below as well. Thank you again. And we will catch up with y'all tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Have a good evening. Bye.